Welcome back. First video of the 2024 season as far as fly tying goes. And I think it's the first video that we've shot on fly tying in about a year. We had a crazy year last year, very shorthanded. We just didn't, we could not get behind this camera. And so, but we've been shooting the fishing videos and I appreciate everybody watching them. They're having a great, they're, they're being received very well. And so, but I, I just, you know, I really missed the fly tying thing. And so uh, we decided to start, we're gonna try to do one of these every other week with the fishing ones every other week. So basically once a week. We've got a few additions. One, we're gonna try a different camera. I'm trying to get a different angle here. Usually I tie with my vise way over like this and it's really a pain in the butt. So we're trying something different. If you don't like it, write in. I'm sure some people write in, no matter if they like it or not. But, but uh, anyway, I wanted to go, like I said, it's, it's the first one, it's March 5th. It is nuking outside. It is blowing like 70 miles an hour, snow just ripping sideways. And I just spent the last month cleaning up fly boxes and getting things set up for spring. And I wanted to go over something because I go, I've been listening to a lot of comments or you know, watching them on the YouTube channel. And a lot of, there's a lot of the same questions. And one of them, uh, or, or comments, I might, you know, they, they say that, you know, we burn flies and we rip them really fast and we fish big flies. And, and that's just not true at all. I mean, we, I fish a lot more small flies than I fish giant flies. Everything has a time and a place. And if you're trophy hunting, you better know that you can't just do one thing. And so I decided to tie this fly they call the big hole bug which is a super old fly. This fly is, I don't know, I don't have Johnny here to tell me, but I'm guessing this fly is 13, 14 years old and has been just an absolute killer for me. And, I, and, and part of me wanting to bring this up and tie it was, I just wanted to explain to people that it's not just speed. And I just got done saying how cold it is outside. Well, as soon as we start fishing streamers, because right now it's, you know, it's, the water temp's pretty cold for streamer fishing. And so, but if we did, we wouldn't be burning the flies. We'd be fishing them very slow. And I do a ton of jigging and I, and I harp about this. I just preach it and preach it. Have more than one retrieve. Don't just be, don't just strip the line like this. Have something that gives you an animation like this and a jigging style. If you do not jig, especially in cold water, if you do not jig, you are leaving so many fish in the water, it's unreal. I mean. If all you've got is to pull on your line and do this crap, you're a one trick pony, right? And if you have ever watched any other style of fish in the world, if you've ever watched any bass fishing or any really good you know, spinner fisher people or you know, crankbait people for steelhead or salmon, you'll notice that they don't just go one speed. And you shouldn't either. You should do this, this, right? You should have two or three different ways to do that. And this is, and I just, I grabbed this box. You see, I just finished renaming everything. And I have about 20 of these boxes in my shop, in my garage. And I go in and what I do is I pick out of these boxes, which uh, segues into, I'm gonna have a new fly box release here pretty soon. You'll see, it's really cool. But these are storage boxes. And you can see everything over here is this big hole bug. But then again, so is everything right down here, colors. And then the Nancy P comes off of it. A lot of flies came off of this fly. And it's, it's one of those things where I, I encourage people to take what I'm gonna show you here and adapt it to something else. And I wanna show you one other one right here. Cause this started with this short shank front and the rear end. And what we were trying to do is get things to move up and down. And so like a crayfish, I'm gonna explain that in a second. But this is one, I've got a whole bunch of flies in the back. And I, one of the guys took my boat, Chris took my boat one day and he found a box that says new. And I, I carry that style box. I keep like 20 of them in my boat, right? And he's going through my boat. He's looking at all the flies and he finds one that just says new on it. And it, what that means is they're flies, I've, conceptual flies I came up with and hadn't fished or fished them and I, move them to another side and you know, make a note and say it didn't do this or that. And this is one of them that was in there. And it's, it's one of the flies that I consider, this is really old. This was a concept fly, has a Roman Mauser 
uh, fish skull, uh, sculpt and skull in the front, super no hook at all in the front, and then it's got poppers in the back. So it started with this, morphed to this, went to the tits up, and there's been all kinds of ways that things have changed with it. This is going back up here because it's one of the ones that's, it's 15 years old, not finished. It is just, it's things keep moving along, right? So here's the original style right here. And it's, I, I tied one here and just a couple days ago. And I realized how this fly had morphed just even without me knowing in some ways, because I've switched companies. When I went from one company tying my flies to Montana Fly, we changed the leg set, we changed this, we changed that. What I'm trying to get at is don't be afraid to experiment. I'm gonna to try to tie this one the best I can is to the original version. Most of them have gone to the three sets up front instead of how I originally did it with two and three, which was a five set leg. I'm gonna do it that way. Have not tied one like that in 10 years. I, I had how I do this, and I, I talk about that a lot when the videos is I say sometimes I haven't tied a fly in 10 or 15 years because when I first come out with them, I kind of tend to over tie them, just tie a bunch of them. And then I don't really have to, and by the time they hit production, I get lazy and start stealing them out of the fly bins. And so, but before we get on, I want you just to see something <clears throat> about this fly having a two-tone, all right? It's got a two-tone effect to it. When I was doing the first book, Modern Streamers, the first Modern Streamers, when we were doing that, I did a ton of diving, as a lot of people know, but I also did a seven-hour study of just river crayfish where I would just sit and watch them for about an hour, 35, 40 minutes, whatever I could stand. It is so freaking boring. They do not move. They don't swim. They don't do anything. Subsequent or previous to that, I mean, I probably did 20, 30 hours in Lake Michigan following crayfish around, poking them, trying to get them to do things to see what they would do. And so when I was doing the, the, the crayfish, the river crayfish one, I had Jerry Dennis with me one day and I went down below and I had him throwing crayfish patterns at me. And some of the most elaborate crayfish you could buy at that day, all these great tires. And the first thing I realized is they really looked like crap. They didn't look anything like a, a crayfish. Half of them would spin because they had fixed cray, uh, claws. There was a lot of them that just, they just, they looked great looking at them right there. You seen them in the water, didn't see it because an actual crayfish, when you see it move, if it actually swims, all you see is its pinchers cross like this, and when it scoops with its ass, it goes like this and it twists, and it does that back and forth, and you see light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. The best imitation I saw when, he, when we were throwing him at and it wasn't really an imitation, it was a woolly bugger. And then we threw a JJ, which was a yellow tail and a brown top, and I thought, well, looking at that from what you actually see when the thing's swimming, that was the closest thing we had. It's hence the color combo that come out of this. So that's why we're going to do what we're going to do. Very quickly, uh, nah, that's BS. You all know that I don't do anything quickly. I want to go through the, uh, I want to go through the material stuff. I want to do something else too is before I forget. I've never asked this. I get, I, I don't know why. We've been doing this for 10 years. I've never asked people to subscribe and, you know, like us. I don't know why we don't, but it really helps us keep this thing going. I mean, I got to pay Braden an unbelievable amount of money to sit back there and listen to me all day. Imagine how that is. But we'd really appreciate it if you would. And like I said, I'll forget it at the end because I always do. Uh, 10 years, 15 years, I don't think I've ever remembered. So jumping into these materials, uh, the hooks I'm going to use. Now, the originals weren't like this. We didn't have this hook. This is a 7052 vertical eye ring eye, right? And so instead of having the hook at this orientation flat to the hook, it's vertical up and down. Makes the articulation so much easier. In particular, though, in the front hook, I like this front hook to be a vertical eye because I like the idea that this hook, when the line is through it, absolutely has no other, it has to go up and down. When I jig it, 
it's going to get locked at the top of that. If it's on the side like this, it's possible it could get off to the side, not very likely. I had a lead eye there and it took off running, but so I'm going to start from the back and then as always, it's going to get kind of windy because I'm going to talk about other materials. So the materials on the back are going to be just standard woolly bugger or just uh, marabou, I mean. I also do this with woolly bugger marabou. I love this color in the back. I absolutely love this thing. And so two-tone in it, I just, I didn't want to, do, I want to go to the original, but, and the original was yellow and brown. So I'm going to have woolly bugger, or I'm going to have marabou, I mean, just strung marabou. I'm going to talk about that in a second, strung marabou versus the other ones. Strung marabou, two-tone, don't be afraid to change these colors. I mean, this is the original, as you saw in my box, I was down to about 10, but there was six or seven different colors. Olives on browns, olives on olives, tans on olives are really good. Just, you know, look at the crayfish in your zone. And so, where are we at? That's the tail. The body is going to be, uh, this. the original body was Estes. Then we got Cactus Chenille. Either one of these is a great substitute. I don't know if you can see that. Um, I'm a little out of practice here. Either one, I'm gonna use the original Estes. Um, and again, great spot to substitute stuff. If you wanna throw in a dubbing brush with a really light dubbing brush, or if you wanna do something like that, I did a bunch of them with chenille when I first started doing them. I like the chenille. I don't like when it gets too thick in the front. Do not, if the front of the hook, the, fir, the front hook, if it's got too much Estes or too much build in it, it'll slow that head dropping up and down. That's what we're looking for. So try it, if you're gonna sub it, try to keep it a little bit on the lean side. The stuff I'm using is pretty old. It's, it would be considered, I think, small nowadays because it's smaller than the actual medium, but just, just by a touch. And so not, not too much. And so then we're gonna go into, I forgot one thing on the tail. We're gonna have a couple strands of uh, copper flashaboo. And then we move forward and we got the body I just said was the Estes. We're going to have a hackle of some sort. Where to go to? Strung. I'm going to use strung. I don't really care. I mean, if you use, I like this uh, MFC stuff, this bard, because it's so consistent. Uh, I still work off of hackles that I've been using forever. Just, I don't, this is not some place to buy really quality hackle. It's, it's kind of superfluous to tell you the truth if you didn't have it on there. It wouldn't look dressed to me, but I don't think it would change the fishability of it. We're going to have large uh, yellow lead eyes. If you want to sub this, I showed you that Roman Mauser sculpt and skull. If you want to sub this for a cone head, fish is great. It's easier to tie. If you want to put a little cone on, that's not a problem. Uh, I've done it with a lot of mine. So what else have we got? Brassy, got a little brassy. We're going to counter thread. We're gonna counter wrap this hackle with some wire, whatever size, I mean, you can, that's up to you what you like on that. Uh, I like brass, you just don't, I never had one break. I've never had any of them break, so uh, let's see. And then they're, they're gonna have articulation wire I had out here somewhere, whatever you like. I mean, I use the 17 pound. I like the multi strand, as many strands as I can get on this stuff, and we are good to go. So. Onto the back hook. Oh, and I'm using six aught Semperfly Nano Silk, and so the back of this fly is really, really rudimentary. It is, it is just stacks of marabou. There is nothing more to it. How you, nothing. It is. Just, it's super simple. As I told you, I haven't watched it or haven't done a video in a year, but I've uh, fly time. But I've watched a bunch of my old ones, and I, I've been watching. I didn't. I don't get too caught up in reading the comments. For those of you that love to hate, uh, you waste your time on me. But it is kind of funny to listen to some of you dumbasses. Uh, <laughs> some of these people need a life, man. Uh, but the point being is that there's some really funny ones too. I was doing a seminar with, for Brian Fletching down at Mad River Outfitters, and he says, do you know the click it deal? And the click it deal is if I'm talking like this and I take my glasses off, you're supposed to fast forward five minutes because I'll stop, never stop talking. I thought it was hilarious. So, <laughs> and I say so a lot. Uh, I did listen to a lot of the comments. 
and I'm trying not to fidget as much and trying to finish a sentence. One guy says, can you actually finish a sentence? Not very well. Uh, never was good at that. And they don't let me drink enough coffee on the set. So, so there you go. Uh, too funny. Tails. I want to go through Marabou very quickly because I get that was a that was a very common question when I was listening to the people write in, and you know a lot of questions on materials is what I was saying, and so I just want I've done this before. There's two different types, three different types of marabou. There is strung marabou, which is just, and I think I have a whole tutorial on this. There's strung marabou, and there's uh, blood quills like this, and I'll show you this in a second. They're the same. Uh, they're still marabou, and then there's woolly bugger marabou, which are shorter. And I'm going to show you all three of these. But I just, just as another point, I'm going to talk about the actual colors in a second. But uh, when you look at this stuff, I had one sitting out here somewhere. Here, the difference between these feathers, where is one? One is that this would be what's called a blood quill, right? See how thick that shaft is? These are designed, and they used to call these spay hackle also. And they're su supreme. They had a bunch of names for them. And it really, all it means is it's a longer hackle. For what I do, I don't like these at all. I have those out because it's the color I wanted. But what I find with these is if you're, if you're the person who uses the edges of these, these work pretty well. Now, and I've mentioned this many times. People, I've had a lot of people ask me why I mention other tires' names it's because they're my buddies, and uh, I, I, I watch these guys constantly, Charlie Craven being one of them. Charlie likes to pick the edges of these for his tails and then use that because they're very wispy. If you do that a lot, now I don't do that. I've already picked mine, and these are the regular marabou quill, and they're much shorter, and I use the tips, right? Charlie doesn't use the tips. Well, he might on some, but in the ones I've seen, he, used, he likes to strip the edges. A better idea is for these with that, right? With, with this uh, blood, with the blood quills. And because you get a lot of it. I don't like to use that, and so I don't. But I was looking, that segues me into this color thing. I wanted to use these. I only, that's the only one I could find in this color. I've got bags and bags of marabou, right? I couldn't find this color, and all I had were these blood quills, and I only had about three that were good. And you've heard me say this before in the videos. If you better get used to losing about 30 to 40% of your material, when you, especially with marabou. You're going to drop 50% sometimes. And, so, and another thing that brings that up is color. And so this is a sunburst yellow, right? And I use a ton of yellow in my flies. I mean, brown trout are my preferred species. I have yellow in so many of my flies. But this is a sunburst yellow. And here are three colors of yellow, which are all yellow. This is something else you got to get used to. I can't, I do not like this pale, I do not like this pale yellow. I don't like that brightness. I really like that color right there. And these, and this, Absolutely same dye lot. I mean, same, not same dye lot. Same, you know, it's marabou, right? I can get this, I can buy it, buy, we buy so much material. I'll get 25 bags of one, and there'll be three different color shades in there. It's just something you got to get used to. I wish we had some control over it. I have no control over it whatsoever. I did forget one thing. The rubber legs are going to be uh, root beer rubber legs, but we'll get to that in a second. So if you were watching those comments where it says, if I take my glasses off and put them on, but it's supposed to be these. If I take these off, if I'd have done that before, you could have saved yourself five minutes. You wouldn't have had to listen to that. So I'm going to start this. I've already got my thread on here. There's no body on this. This is strictly marabou. And I've already pulled these out to save a little bit of time. Uh, the colors, when I put these on, I like to moisten those slightly. I do not think you can air too badly on this if you're, because there's so much marabou, but I still like to use the hook as the gauge. I like to measure it. The length of the hook is what I like to have my tail sets at. And then I'm going <clears> to <throat> put two turns on this, 
Just nice soft turns, just so you can see it's on top of the hook right now. And then just roll it under. I like to use, leave that stem, especially on the t first set, because I'm, it's the only one that I have to roll it around. Because I like to make sure I split those tails, and I think you'll be able to see better with this new angle. And then just two or three turns, and I'm going to cut this. I don't like to cut this one because I have a tendency to cut my thread at an angle. I don't like to reach under there, so I just pull it off to the side. I'm just going to tighten that up. Just nice, even turns. Just clean that. It's kind of a bigger gob on that one. And then I'm going to take my flashaboo, which I told you I forgot when I was sitting there, but I'm using copper flashaboo. I don't know if I showed you that. Um, copper flashaboo. I don't want a lot of this, and so I'm going to take it and put. I'm going to. Don't really care where you tie that in. I'm kind of right in front of the where it is where the I tied in. And I like, I like just a little bit of that to stick out the back. I got one straggler. And then I fold it right over itself. Do not let go. Nice clean right there. Come in and get it the same length as the other one. Now we're going to stack on top of this. And this is a great spot if you like the click it game. I could fake you out. You could, once I get this one on, you could fast forward because it's going to be three more. So here, and I like to come slightly in front. So I have the first one tied in, and then I'm going to, I want it to be just a little bit, I, I look at my flashaboo, and I want it to be very close to the same as the other marabou. And when I, I came forward slightly on this one, I don't have, that way I don't have to work on that other that little bit of marabou that was built up there. Three or four nice tight turns. Just clip it off, move forward. We're going to do three of these. Nice clean wraps forward, three turn or to the center. Now we're going to do the same thing. We're going to stack. And each one of these, I want you to get about half to a third of the layer. So when you lay it, when you put this up here, and you see, most of you have seen me tie before, uh, I would assume, but it's, it's better not to put this in your mouth, but it works a lot better if you do. If you get a sponge and just with a little bit of moisture on it, go like that, it's easier to see what you're working with. So I want it to be, I want it to layer halfway, but again, it's the same thing on this one. Two turns, roll it under, just no tension on that when you roll it. When you look, make sure it's nice and even on both sides. Three or four turns. Oops. Wax your thread. That's a, then just clean that up. Move forward, same thing. I go forward each time, just getting out of the bulk of that. And I just lay that over so it lays halfway over that one. You can do a half to a third. Nice, clean, tight wraps. Leave your space for the head. The last one's going to be the same thing right over top of that. And these will, once they dry out, they'll be a little bit fluffier than that. And this one, I always try to save my biggest one. This is the biggest hackle. It's the fluffiest one, if you will. And so that one I save because if there's any place that I was, if the, you know, if I compromise, if this feather wasn't that great or whatever, I just make sure that the last one, because it's going to cover, you know, and so I take a pretty good chunk of that. That's a little heavy. Same thing. And I always, if you notice, I measure off the top wing because it's just easier than going down here, going yellow on yellow. It's really easy to see when I lay that up there that I'm a, a half to a third of the way around it. And because, so this one I'm going to, I like to have about a four turn head on this. So one, two, roll it under. Make sure, and this one's really important that you look to see that both sides are covered, don't have any gaps there. And then we'll 
And again, this is all going to get covered up anyway. But we'll clean that up just a little bit. And then we're going to take our last one. And again, same thing. Nice full marabou plume here. Because this is what, this is, there's all the action is back here. I'm going to cut this one off just because it's easier for me to work with. I'm using really fine thread, so I'm able to kind of reef on that. I just wanted to clean that up a little bit. I don't want to see that. Um, yeah. Problem with really fine thread is it doesn't build up too quick, so it's a little harder to see to cover those up. Now glue that. I'm not going to glue mine. Glue that. That's your back hook. So. As you can see, all I've got is a two-tone effect. There's nothing to that. There's no body. There's no underbody. Now, the big hook is on the back of this. That's, that's the difference. Um, I see a lot of people that were tying them, they would take the bigger hook and put it up front and have a shorter one back here. I want more in the back. I used to tie this fly with a 710. I believe is what it was. I dropped my lead eye. I tied it with a 710 uh, Dairiki, or uh, yeah, and it was kind of a short shank hook. And so, but I always made it two sizes longer in the back because I wanted this thing. I want this fly's designed to do this. We're we're designing that on purpose. So a little wax in your, this GSP, there's all these gel spun threads. And, that, and by the way, that's a trick. If, uh, if you haven't seen that before, I stole that from Davey Watton. Or excuse me. Woo, he might kill me if he said that. Davey Watton's a phenomenal tire also. I stole that from Davey McFeel. Davey McFeel, I think, uh, he's one of those cats to me. He's, he's in that top tier of tires maybe you know there's a lot of great tires in the world I mean a lot and but Davey McFeel's one of those I can sit and watch that guy for hours I, one guy told me he says I I can't understand him he's got a really heavy accent I said, who cares look at his hands the guy is a magician with materials man he's just frightening but I learned this wax thing uh this one's kind of squished around, but when you work with this thread, it is just that little touch, just that easy right there. When you're working with these gel spuns, which in my estimation in the last, I think it's that the, the GSP threads are the biggest advancement in fly tying history. I mean, you can work with 18 aught thread and you can barely break it. I don't know, it's really almost impossible and you get zero build, and as a tire's tip, if I ever had a real tip, it would be that the smaller your thread, the better your fly will be, if it's strong, if you're not breaking it constantly. And if you watch, I can reef on this stuff. This is six aught. Is six aught of the nylon days, you'd be snapping that every, I mean, you just couldn't do it. So let me get back to this thing. Where was I? Uh, I was going to tell you, there's no bead here. There's, uh, I, I put it on, I got a little ahead of myself. There's no bead on this. If you want to put one on, fine, but I don't use, beads were originally designed to keep flashaboo from getting stuck inside the wire. And we put that, uh, when Russ and I first started, Russ Madden and I, when we first started tying these, we had a, a lot longer loop. And we put flashaboo back there and end up getting caught up in the thing. So we put the bead on there to stop that. And so how I do this, if you noticed, I, I put that and I pulled on it really hard and I got a little groove in it. I think you can see that from any, any one of the cameras. I get a little groove in it. It makes it easier for me to see the wires to make sure they're running parallel. And the key to this new hook, the 7052 uh, Montana Fly Company hook, is that in the old days the hook was like this and we had to come up the side and roll the wire. Now we just lay it, we can see it very easily right on top of the, the hook. 
you can look down and see that they're not crossed. Here, let me come back here. That's another thing I do a lot. Braden told me that one. So three turns on here, just tight enough because you've got a little wax on there. You get to adjust it. If you get more than that, I have four on there evidently, you can't adjust it well, right? So you can do this. And as soon as I broke that wax there, it kind of you know, slid along a little easier. But I like this hook. When I look at it, the front of the back hook, it should be right in line with the bend of the hook on the front hook. And that's, that's up to you. If it's too loose, it's going to flip around. If it's too tight, you're going to lose some of your action. So just set it right, you know, I like mine right in line. It's got plenty of movement back here. Get a hold of that. And then I want you to move forward with your wire on top. <clears throat> Some people like to glue these. I have no problem with gluing them. But I want you to see what I'm doing with mine. I've got my lead eyes on here. And you notice they're, they're, they're totally loose. I just did a few figure eights to get them to hang on there. And now I've got to have room for my eye, or my head I mean. And I've got to be able to get this wire through the eye of the hook. And so, and I've, I've done this hundreds and hundreds of times. I've talked about this. It's, if you want to glue it, we've glued plenty of them. Cut it off and right now and glue it. And try to break them loose. It's almost impossible. But there's this, you know, I, I go all over the world talking about this stuff. And I mean, I've got a reputation as a streamer guy. And people tell me everywhere I go, oh, you catch those huge fish every, all, all, all the time. You know, you always catch those. That is such a crock of crap. Nobody catches them all the time. Nobody, I mean, few people catch them even ever. And you're going to get one or two or three shots at it in your life, or not in your life, but I mean in a season. If you're hunting, if you're really out just hunting these things, for the three or four seconds it takes me to do this to be sure that it's not going to come undone, I'm going to take the chance. Because if, like I said, if you're really, really lucky or you're the best angler in the world, you might get three or four shots a year at fish like this. I don't want anything to go wrong. So this is how I do my own. As you see that the eyes back here, when I put those on, I don't think I mentioned, I just kind of threw them on there. I did a couple figure eights just to get them. They're just flopping all over, right? So now I put the wire, I came forward, I put the wire one way and then the other. And now I want you to make sure that you take really clean wraps right tight to the eye and then take one side, doesn't matter which one you use first, and I want you to come back very close to that, come back forward and pull this one, and you want them underneath the hook. And you need to, you need to tie these things. Got a little ahead of myself there. I want it to go right back trying to get it up so you can see. I want those to be as close to the eye as possible and make sure right now that that eye is centered. I'm, I'm looking over top of it. Hopefully from this angle we can see it. And I'm going to work this thread as close to there as I can to see to the lead eye. And then I'm going to pull these over, come back, and I'm going to secure. Now I'm just going to get it so you can see. i got to make sure everything's where I want it. And I want these right on top of the hook. We'll get to that in a second. So now make sure these are centered. So it's right dead center. And so we got as close as we could on both sides, tightening down. And now we're going to go around the hook. And I'm going to squeeze the wire into the lead. So, you know, I'm not going figure eighting around it. I got as close as I could so it was really cinched down so they can't go forward. And I got as close as I could on the back and nice and tight. And then you just start going around the wire itself two or three turns and just reef on it. If, and just it'll secure. Then if you want to do a figure eight, that's fine. Now I'm going to take this wire down to about the little past the third point, cut it off. You're always looking to build a taper. Everything you do in fly tying is a taper. So 
don't cut it off all the way back here because your body will be the same length. Now just kind of clean things up. Make sure everything's where you want it. Your eyes, I mean, you, can, you can't. If you want to hit it with a drop of glue now, that's fine. I, I never do. So now we have the, I want to go back to what we were talking about with this marabou. I was talking about woolly bugger marabou. This is grizzly marabou. Same thing, it's still all woolly bugger. What that means is that these are very short, tiny little feathers, right? They have a, I don't know why they call them woolly bugger because it would be a, unless you were tying a tiny little woolly bugger, it'd be a terrible tail, but it has, it has two functions. And I use this a lot when I'm doing my, this is the cover. This is the cover for the connection. And so there's two ways to do this. If you want to use just the tips here and run it on, you know, underneath, or you can do, these are usually really clean. You can pull that hole. I took an inch, maybe not quite an inch off the side. So I, I think you can see that. I just pulled that much off and that's going to be my connection back into the back hood, right? So it's just kind of giving it a little bit of height. So I'm going to do the same thing I did before. Two turns, roll it under. Make sure you can see this side that it's halfway around. Just get your scissors and pull it. And tighten it up. Little wax. This stuff's pretty fluffy, so. And then we're going to cut off this excess. I want to cut this just at where I cut the wire off. That just gives me a little bit of bulk. This stuff is really fluffy. Wow, that was kind of a disaster. And I hit my hook. We're going to cover that in a second. Now we're going to do the same thing. I'll tie the tip in this time just so you can see. The last time, all I did was I take the side, pull it off. This time I'm going to do it like I do with the other ones because I think it's a little easier tying in unless you break that off like I just did. There's just not as much to all that fluff that was on there. I'm going to let that lay right into the hook. Get a second chance to clean everything up now. Come forward. Now we're going to take that brassy wire. This is going to, we're going to counter wrap this. So I'm going to come in here where I, you can see, maybe on this camera you can see, that's where my wire ended, right? And so I'm going to tie that in so I can see it. Do two or three turns. I'm going to bring it back here. Give me you. And I like to do that. I like to bend those, fold them over. It's, it's just an integrity thing. If you get used to building as much structural integrity into this as you can, and you more clean wraps, not, not a lot of superfluous wraps that are just kind of there, you're, you know the thing's got integrity. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hold up. So when I take this wire and I go forward, and a lot of times you'll see people just put their wire in, four or five turns, come back, they go to use it, and they give it a pull, and it pops out. You, couldn't, you can't pull this out of here. It's impossible. So we are going to the, the cactus chenille or the estes, whichever you do. Now, I want you to see something. When you tie this stuff in, strip a little of that off. Just strip this, the, this junk out of here. That's a stranded nylon in there or cotton, whichever it is. And what I'm going to get is a really clean, I'm going to get a really clean tie-in, right? I'm not going to have a bunch of that excess. And this is where I think we changed things when we went from the sets of two different sets of two and three to a single uh, set up front. I don't know if that was me being lazy, the company being lazy. I don't know where it came from. 
but I'm going the other OG style here. And so I'm going to tie this in just like always, and I want you to see something when you do this. And, and I think this is one of the, the most important parts of fly tying, and I know it's one of, I, I was looking at some of those questions about the Q&A stuff, and we always, we're going to bring back the Q&A, by the way, and it's where we just ask people for questions. And I just read this person's Q&A, and it said, I'd like to see you do the top 10 screw-ups in fly tying. And I can tell you, and I've said it a hundred times, maybe a thousand, the number one is rushing the head, not leaving room for the head of the, uh, the fly. Number two is this first turn right here. In particular, in if you're a rotary person. So if you were to take off and just start going, people have a tendency to do their first turn and they go like that and they end up leaving a gap right there. And it just looks like crap. It probably doesn't do anything. Uh, I'm going to do this one by hand because I've got to start and stop so many times. It's so back to where we were. So the number two thing, I'm certain, is leaving that gap right there. But I want you to see where my thread's hanging down. It's just in front of the tip of my hook, all right? Because I want that to be where the first set of legs goes in. So, but when you do this, do one complete turn. I, I got all the way around. Put your finger and kind of grab everything and just stretch that and make sure that first turn is absolutely locked in. And I don't care what you're using, chenille, anything, cotton strands, nylon strands, just get, and it's going to be about three turns right here and we're going to set the first set of legs. Come here, you. I'm going to set it forward and then I'm going to set right on top of these. All right, and when you do this, the back set is two. And I want you to see, this is, this is kind of critical, I think. It's not critical, but it makes tying rubber legs a lot easier. And I don't know if you'll be able to see this in the camera, but I'm gonna kind of leave it forward a little bit so you can, or at least try to. It's the first time we've used this overhead camera like this. So I went from, I put, I put, I try to get them centered first, and I come right to left, left to right, and I want you to realize there's no pre I have no tension on this thread whatsoever. And then just get it out of your way, go in front of it, do one complete turn, make sure it's right where you want it, pull straight down. You do one, not just a half turn, do, call it two turns because it, 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 that's what you need. You need two turns and then pull straight down and you will never have the, the, you'll see my legs have not moved. They're right on top and they're spread out nicely. The figure eight is where, the figure eight is what tightens down, but you don't, you're not squeezing the thread so hard with one in this way that they're rolling on you. They're set perfectly and then you get to do it again, right? You get tighten it down and they're just right where they belong piece of cake so another turn right just look at them I think it needs one right there and then we're going to push them back with the next one just kind of look at these to see what you like the looks of I mean I've seen guys lean them way back and then they kind of lay too far against the body in my opinion and then I've seen people move them where they're way forward trying to get them so they kind of push forward and kick back like that. Looks pretty cool, I don't know. I set mine the same way every time. So I'm gonna get right behind here, the eyes. I want room for one, <clears throat> I want room for one set, one more set here. I'm gonna set them right on top. I, I go right back over the chenille. This one has three. One, two, three. Where did that thing go? The straw trick. For those of you who have not seen this, you simply take a straw, cut it to whatever length you want, then cut it lengthwise just to get this stuff out of your way. And back you go. So I, kind of, I just kind of look at these, just set them up to where I think they're pretty close to centered. And then I do right shoulder to left shoulder. You can see there's just a little turn of thread there. 
and I put my figure eight over it. And you can see how loose this is. So there's, there's the, and I'm right on top of all this stuff. It's, it's all over the place, right? All I'm doing is I'm adjusting these. I'm pulling, picking them up, adjusting them so they're the same length or roughly there too, right there. Now watch, I've got the figure eight. If you look, you can see that right there. There's a figure eight right on top. Now I'm gonna go one, well that's one, two turns. Okay, I caught on that. Pull straight down and I'm done. I never touch the rubber legs. The figure eights, the only thing that touches them, they're set permanent, you're done. Now we're going to finish this Estes. And I usually do a figure eight around that just so I have the bottoms covered. And then we're going to make sure you've got room for your, we got to tie off this head. And this again, when I was in the beginning of the video, this is the eternally long videos. When you get to this, I said you could use a cone head. Man, and it, it's a lot easier working with these eyes. Uh, cone heads did not come in. Now watch what I'm doing here before I finish this. I didn't cut that off tight to the really close. I cut it so I could strip that stuff out of there again. And then I'm going to catch those strands. So I don't have a lot of buildup right here because I still have to put the head on or put the hackle on. But what I was saying is that in the old days, we didn't have, we didn't have tungsten cone heads. And the regular cone heads, the brass ones we had, just weren't heavy enough to make this thing do its deal. So we just used the lead eyes. So the last thing we're going to do is put this hackle on. I just grabbed, like I said, I used the MFC, the barred stuff. I use. I, ha I have a ton of this uh, brown olive hackle, and I like to use. It's just I've, I've got so much. It's what I always have used on it. So I'm using what I originally did. And so when you look at hackle, I want you to see this. If your hackle bends and it breaks like that, if it stays bent, don't tie it in there. You can see the hackle's already broke. I like to get this little bit of aftershaft fluff that's on here if I can, but this hackle's just about to the point where I don't want to try to get that. I'm going to tie it in really close. I do this a little different than most people. I come into the <clears throat> wax your thread right here because it really helps to hold. I'm going to hold the hackle in place. I'm going to bump the thread or the, the feather to my thread and catch it that way. One, two wraps, and it's wax, so it's not. That wax is, I, I mean, of all the tires, of all the tricks I've ever learned, and I don't know why I quit using wax. When I was a kid, you always did. I just, I kind of quit using it. And I saw Davy McPhail do it, and I went, oh, my God, how, come I, how could I have forgot that? But it, it, it's like gluing. It just, it just locks you in. So I'm going to just kind of work my way back here. This is the biggest pain with this fly, by the way, is just trying to miss all these rubber legs. And I dropped these. I was flying home from doing some seminars and I had my materials I had my materials in a bag in a a very nice fish pond fly tying bag and as always I had my crazy glue in there and as always I put it in a plastic bag just in case it blows up like it always does on the plane and it did and it somehow got out of the bag and got, I got it with uh, all over my hackle pliers. So they're a little less grabby than they used to be. So if you see, I, I wrapped that back. I just kind of got it where, got it to the, as close as I could even missing those legs. It's a pain in the butt, really. But I want you to see what I'm doing. I've, I tied it in and I wrapped just wrapped it over the hook backwards and I have this wire and I had it set on the back side so when I do this first turn 
immediately I know that that's caught. There's my, there's my hackle stem. And then I'm going to work forward right through this. And I generally tell people to move as fast as you can, but you can't do that with these rubber legs. So just move as fast as you can without trapping any of your rubber legs. I like to get in front of that and then give it one turn right over the hackle. Catch it close. A lot of stuff going on in there. So catch that, couple turns, wax that thread now. Forward, I usually go right to the eye of the hook then bend it back right between the eyes. Keep your thread nice and tight, you can just pop that off, not cutting with your thread with your wire with your th uh, scissors that way. Got a couple strands hanging out there. Okay, so now we've got our hackle tip right here. He's gone. Like I said earlier, if you were to not put the hackle in here, I don't think it would make any difference. I just did it on my first ones and so it looked nice and so I left it. So now double check that you don't have anything too crazy, nothing's captured anywhere. Cut your legs off. I like to, I just pull them down and cut them. I'm a little off on that one, but there I've got. So you got five legs. If you wanna shorten those, feel free to shorten them. I never do, I leave them on there. They're, they're crazy, they're all over the place. This'll all lay down. Get everything in place here. There. So we now have two sets. If you want to go with the three, where's that one I tell you yesterday? If you want to roll that in with three legs up front, probably won't be much different. Be a lot easier to tie in. Than, but I think in the old days, I like to make things more difficult. So that's the big hole bug. If you live where there's tannic water, meaning it's kind of a brown stain. This is anything in the east, anything that side of the Mississippi will get tannic water. The big hole is almost always tannicky, looking that kind of rusty brown color. I love brown on brown. I don't, and I, when I fish any of that water, uh, that's always the brown with the yellow. I love those variegations. I like how that looks. But if you see this, if you look at it, you can see there's going to be a lot of movement with that. We've got the ring eye hook, which means the line's going to come out the top. And I want you to learn to take this and just pick it up and let it down. Pick it up and let it down. Do this. Make the fly swim. Make it go up and down. Crayfish don't do this, but that's how we fish them. And it's the, it's the two-tone of the fly. It's the color change going light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. That's what makes these things so effective and so good on the... Uh, Crayfish water, again, spring water, which we're in right now, when you get above 45 degrees, you better have a slow retrieve, see what you can do. Remember to hit the like button if you would. We could really, we could really use it. It's getting hard to afford this guy. He's really expensive. Everything that's on this fly is on our website. We have kits for it. We've got everything you need for it. But uh, again, as far as fishing the fly goes, I would really encourage you to learn how to jig a fly. All you got to do is lift your rod up, pick up the excess. Just watch your fly. Make it fish slow. Hope you like it. Hope it helps you out.